Good morning, everyone. My name is Steven Snyder. Thank you for joining us wherever in the world you are. It's a beautiful day here in Boston, but I know we have people joining from midnight over in Eastern Asia. So welcome to everyone who is here for our first session for our second day of OI Conference. And this is a virtual webinar series hosted by Harvard's Environmental Club in partnership with Oikos International, a sustainability group um, that has uh, master's students and undergrads from around the world participating in sustainability and finance and management and curriculum change. Um, so as I said, I'm one of the organizers of this event. And what we will be doing is having a session on sustainability perspectives from Asia. We have three really great speakers here and an awesome moderator who will go um, and lead you through the discussion. Um, what I'm going to do now is share with you the app we are using to ask Q&A. Um, Q&A will be at the end of all three presentations and you will be able to upvote which sessions you are, uh, um, which questions you would like answered first. Um, so go ahead and add some questions now. And let me introduce our moderator. So Karen is a very dear friend of mine. Um, we got to meet to get last year and work together as part of uh, Oikos International. And I'm really happy to have her here because this is the second time she's helped us out with our series. She's a master's student at um, EDHEC in France, and she's studying, um, a getting a master's in strategy consulting and finance. She's also been a president of the Oikos Lilly chapter and is um, interested in this topic because she's had internships in ESG and um, is looking to continue to work in the field of sustainable investing. So Karen, I'd love to hand it over to you now. Feel free to take the floor. Thank you, Stephen, for the lovely introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first session of the day, Sustainability Perspectives from Asia. So I'm just going to give you a brief outline of how the session will go. Um, we have, we're very lucky to have three experts who are going to all share their, their very diverse perspectives on this topic. Uh, first, we have Dr. Kishore Ravuri, who is a regional, regional sustainability advocate and the founder of Impacto. He works with leaders and practitioners in developing Asia to help them build their business case for sustainability. He's going to kick off the session by speaking about board level sentiments in the region and sustainability in general. Then we're going to have Yip Yesi from the UN Environmental Program um, Finance Initiative and she's going to take us on a tour around Asia, highlighting important macro developments in the region. Yuki works towards the development of financial institutions that integrate sustainability as a value creation driver and which contribute to the UN SDGs. Finally, we have Luan Si, who will share with us a micro view of a bank managing sustainability. As the head of group sustainability at CIMB, she is responsible for transforming CIMB into a leader of sustainable finance in the Asian region. Um, Kish, the floor is yours. So very good evening, everyone. Uh, so before my esteemed uh, panelists deep dive into sustainable finance, uh, I'm going to share with you uh, the climate of opinion amongst the board members and senior leadership uh, in Asian organizations on sustainability and sustainable finance. Uh, so I'm going to share six key points, uh, more like dilemmas, which, uh, and in the process also raise some critical questions, which are always deliberated at board and CEO level, uh, which kind of determine the approaches of sustainability of organizations, uh, the pace at which uh, they would like to move, how fast, how slow the kind of resources they would like to allocate for sustain for meeting their sustainability agenda. So my first point, without further ado, my first point is about the checkbox or the tick box mentality. Boards and CEOs uh, in Asian organizations are still at a very nascent stage. They are struggling to find the right kind of motivation to embark on sustainability. Uh, and often they find themselves running into the risk of doing something as long as it meets some basic requirements of the regulate, regulators and 
as long as they're being seen as doing something as opposed to doing nothing. Uh, and that's why I think one of the most critical questions the CEOs always raise uh, when they're having board meetings is, what is the motivation for sustainability and sustainable finance? And this becomes extremely critical uh, to even start articulating the business case that would justify the kind of investments that they would need uh, to fully operationalize a sustainability plan. Uh, the second part is about the balancing act. Uh, we all know about the triple bottom line. Uh, like in other parts of the world, the early adopters, even in Asian countries, uh, the early adopters of triple bottom line, they kind of understand the concept as a balancing act uh, with a trade-off mentality. Uh, what is fundamentally wrong with this kind of approach is that one of the three Ps, people, planet, profit, one of the three Ps do not necessarily weigh equally on the scale of importance. So some Ps become optional rather than something that's imminent and that has to be done for both survival and competitiveness. Uh, I can remember the John Elkington, the father of Triple Bottom Line, who went public uh, a couple of months back, last year, late last year, saying that the Triple Bottom Line failed to bury the fundamental concept of single bottom line. And this is this can't be more real for Asian companies with their short-term focus on uh, quarterly target uh, targets. Uh, they rarely have uh, the right kind of insights and enough sightline to adequately anticipate and proactively prepare for the mounting pressures related to environmental, social, and governance factors. So the dilemma is always, what is that we may lose in the bargain? Will sustainable finance help us to capture more market share? So these are the kind of questions which board members raise. Uh, not necessarily the right kind of questions for them to pose uh, because I think they need to move away from the trade-off mentality or trying to balance one of the three Ps. My next point is about from sustainable to sustainable finance, uh, there is a huge gap. Uh, boards and CEOs who already believe in sustainability uh, and that sometimes means blurring the lines between let's say corporate philanthropy and sustainability as well uh, because everyone is learning. Uh, but believing in sustainability doesn't necessarily mean or translate into strategic in interventions by the board or CEOs along their value chains, including sustainable finance. Uh, for instance, banks who have adopted uh, some business as usual guidelines and thresholds, uh, it's mainly because of the minimum requirements under local regulations. Uh, if you look at ASEAN countries, uh, only 14% of the banks actually require their clients to commit to international sustainability standards for their sector policies. And less than 10% of the banks have actually developed a strategy to manage climate related risks or conducted uh, climate risk assessments, even though regulators are increasingly expecting banks uh, to test the resilience of their loan books to climate risks and report the results. So are we really ready to look at our loan book portfolios? Uh, are we, uh, can we not just watch the, uh, watch the early adopters for a while? So everyone is kind of playing that waiting game uh, and nobody wants to be the first one to test the waters. So that's another dilemma which boards usually face. Uh, the next point is about the ecosystem itself. Uh, I would like to share a little bit of data from Worldwide Fund. Uh, the 2019 report on sustainable finance clearly highlights how the financial regulators in the top five markets, which is Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, um, they together represent about 85% of the ASEAN's GDP. Uh, so in these markets, WWF has already seen shoring up of regulatory safeguards against environmental and social risks. Uh, however, the contention, the debate is again, whether the ecosystem is too nascent or whether it is not matured enough. Uh, should the regulation come first? Uh, shouldn't there be a level playing field for everyone? So these are uh, very real questions which kind of uh, also impacts uh, 
the decision making process on sustainability or sustainable finance. Uh, supply chain is also a very critical aspect. Uh, not many companies, many Asian homegrown companies have embarked on supply chain sustainability. Uh, we all recognize the B Corp movement that recognizes businesses that have shifted beyond the trade off mentality. Uh, the B Corp philosophy is basically not to be in the not to be the best in the world, but to deliver the best for the world. Uh, so as against the CEOs and boards in Asia who believe that doing business and doing good are two different things on the same agenda of sustainability. B Corps kind of embrace a universal philosophy of using business as a force for good, which necessarily means designing better and more responsible offerings for the marketplace. And this requires them to look deeper into the supply chains and how they matter in terms of managing the impacts of business on environment and society. And this is something which is in principle lacking with Asian leadership. Uh, and the last part is uh, dilemma is always about the structure and governance. Uh, and this is important because uh, it matters who in the organization is positioning and or articulating the case for sustainability. Uh, in very few instances in this part of the world, the agenda is driven by a strategy or a risk uh, unit. Uh, this is not just important to give sustainability agenda its share of voice, uh, but also to ensure that uh, it, is it is also critical in the formulation of present and future strategies. Uh, what is important to know, note is that the sustainability data needs to be aggregated, it needs to be analyzed in ways that can legitimately and also genuinely help decision makers and policy makers not only to just track and understand, but also manage the systemic effects of human activity uh, and, and how those can be managed better to catalyze growth for organizations. So it doesn't really help when sustainability in Asian organizations more often than not sit with comms, PR and CSR divisions. Uh, and, and, and that's something that uh, is always on the agenda of the CEOs on, on, on positioning it in the right manner or putting the right governance in place. Uh, so in summary, I think I'm going to leave everyone with uh, a caution, a word of caution uh, from Mark Carney, the governor of Bank of England, who said that the task of sustainability or of embedding sustainability principles within organizations is quite large, it's huge. Uh, the window of opportunity is getting shorter. Uh, the reason being uh, we, uh, as the decades pass by, as years pass by, we are seeing more and more tipping points uh, as far as the climate emergency is concerned and the increasing social inequality, uh, inequities. But above all, the risks are existential. And I think this is something which the Asian businesses, the CEOs and, and the boards need to recognize sooner than later uh, and, and acknowledge that it, it's it's, now or never and at and, and, and the time the window of time and the window of opportunity is very short for for organizations to not only future proof their businesses but also the people and the communities where they operate well that's 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 all from me for now thank you so much um yeah so thank you very much kish um and now I would like to invite Yuki to the floor, um, if you're ready. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Yuki Yasui, and I work at the United Nations Environment Program um, Finance Initiative. So Kish's introduction was really um, is what we face a lot in Asia today, but at the same time in different countries around Asia, there is a lot of sustainable finance going on in the last 10 to five years. And in the last few years, it's, it's been accelerating very quickly. I just wanna go through a couple of examples of the different uh, motivations, the push and the pull uh, that is going on in sustainable finance in Asia. 
So just a, a very quick introduction about UNEP Finance Initiative first. It's a global uh, partnership between United Nations Environment Program and financial institutions around the world. Uh, we have mainly banks and they are mainly Europeans, but it is also a global initiative as well. Now, uh, on sustainable finance, I want to focus on the, the pulling the long-term capital allocation on this uh, uh, screen. So what is pulling long-term capital allocation towards the SDGs are three main factors. And I will go through these three by showing some case study. So first of all, the international private finance. So the first case is Japan, which is where I come from. Um, this is where um, you can see on this screen the, the global growth of sustainable investment, uh, investing assets uh, between 2016 and 2018. And you can see for Japan, there was a tremendous growth in this period, 300%. Um, and this was very much uh, as a result of a universal asset owner's influence over the capital markets. So in Japan, the Japanese Government Pension Investment Fund, which is one of the world's, it is actually the world's largest institutional investor at $1.5 trillion of assets under management, uh, they joined the Principles for Responsible Investment in 2015 and quickly became a very vocal prominent proponent of ESG invest, investing. And that really excited the Japanese market, but also um, other uh, ESG invest, investors worldwide. So in Japan, it, it really catalyzed the ESG investment space, and it grew at over 300% during two years, and it's, it's, it's continuing to grow very much. Uh, today, the GPIF is also the global leader uh, in the development of ESG in passive investment, which is tracking indexes. Another example is a international uh, where the motivation is following the international public finance. And this case is in Mongolia. So in Mongolia, it's, it's been a unique case and a lot of other uh, lower and middle income con uh, developing countries are trying to emulate. This is where the banking industry has um, led collectively in, in, in an initiative to access the international public finance, which is increasingly geared towards SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. So from 2014, the Mongolian uh, Bankers Association has developed the sustainable finance principles, have set up a, a, a dedicated sustainable finance association, and one of the banks, the ZAC Bank, has um, managed to access the Green Climate Fund as a result. And today they are uh, trying to set up a Mongolian Green Finance Corporation. And uh, a lot of other countries like Cambodia or Kyrgyzstan are trying to emulate Mongolia's success because they understand that international public finance like ODAs and, um, and green climate finance or uh, GEF, the, the Global Environment Fund, are all geared towards SDG and they need to be able to speak that language. Um, another example is where policy and regulation is pulling. Um, the, the pulling sustainable finance and that example can be found in China. So China is actually the global leader in sustainable finance regulation and policy and they started very early from um, 2007 when they first launched the green credit policy which then developed into the credit guidelines and uh, they issued their first taxonomy in 2015 under uh, what is called the Green Bond Standard, which has uh, now been upgraded in 2019 called the Green Industry Catalog. In the meantime, they've also been contributing um, in international discussions. 
around sustainable finance and they have been co-chairing with the UK uh, on the G20's Green Finance Study Group that started from 2016. And they were also a founding member of a group called NGFS. Now, NGFS is the central bank's supervisor network for greening the financial system. This is um, a group that started in 2017 and today has 63 members globally. It's, it's, um, when it started, it was very transformational because sustainability wasn't a mandate of central banks or financial regulators until um, China started to take the lead and the UK started to join in around 2016, 2000, uh, 2016. So today you can see that nearly um, quite a substantial uh, percentage of central banks and financial regulators worldwide understand that sustainability is their mandate. And even the US Federal Reserve says that they are thinking of joining the NGFS soon. The last example is where the environmental change and the societal change is really pulling sustainable finance. So um, you might have seen this before. Uh, this is where how climate change is going to impact cities around the world. And you can see, like, for example, in the US, the Seattle's climate will be like San Francisco by 2050. Uh, the problem is that for Asian countries, um, well, Tokyo is going to be like Shanghai. But if you are talking about places like where I am, which is Bangkok, or where um, the other speakers are, which is KL, uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, they have a climate that they are going to be facing climate change where the new climate is going to be unknown to any place on earth. There is no example. Uh, we know that it will be extreme precipitation and drought at, at the same time and that uh, a lot of people just don't know what's going to happen, what, what, what it would look like in the tropical um, part of Asia. And so what is really pulling uh, a new type of uh, sustainable finance today is forward-looking scenario analysis. It's the first time when climate science is being used in the finance industry to assess forward-looking ESG risk assessment. Um, there are two broad um, trends right now. One is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. This is a voluntary disclosure at the moment of a global uh, voluntary standard on climate risk reporting. And today, nearly 1,000 organizations around the world, not just financial institutions, but corporations worldwide, are supporting TCFD reporting. At the same time, the financial authorities, the NGFS members mainly, that I, I introduced earlier, they are really worried that climate change is a, a, a risk for the financial system. And they are starting to introduce climate change stress testing. Uh, Bank of England is the foremost um, uh, regulator on this, but others are following, including in, in this part of the world, the, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And then uh, at the industry level, we have a lot of voluntary commitments now. Um, for the investors, there is the uh, UN, UNFFI and uh, PRI-led Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance that started in 2019. And under the, UN, the UNFFI's principles for responsible banking, there is also a action called collective commitment to climate change. So um, just to, to say that Asia is where we face the highest risk and the highest opportunities. And some of the first findings that we have found in our TCFD reporting under the UNEP Finance Initiative um, says that 
we, we, uh, Asia has a lot to lose and a lot to gain from climate change. And so this should be uh, what should be motivating Asian banks, Asian financial institutions. Um, but as, as Kish mentioned right now, it is still quite early days for a lot of these Southeast Asian banks and financial institutions overall. I end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuki, for this very comprehensive overview of how sustainable finance has progressed in Asia, especially these great examples, very interesting, um, especially about forward-looking um, scenario analysis. Speaking about the motivation of Asian banks, let's go forward to Luann, who will share with us about how she is managing sustainability at CIMB. Hi. So um, I think Yuki and Kish set um, a very good kind of foundational uh, view of the state of uh, sustainable finance um, in Asia and uh, at the board level, what are the perspectives? Um, I'm going to share the uh, CIMB, that's where I work. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are an ASEAN based bank where we operate in about 15 countries. Um, and um, we just started on sustainability um, not very long ago. Um, so I'm going to share some of uh, what we've done as well as some of the challenges that, that we faced uh, in, in, in moving forward. So um, we started looking at sustainability seriously in only in late 2018 and our primary um, kind of impetus or trigger, I would say, is was the foreign investors especially the european investors um, because the the local investors um, in our part of the world are not um, really focused on sustainable finance although um, many of the big funds have now um, signed up for pri um, that is still moving pretty slowly so um we're as a bank we're one of the I think we've, we've got the highest um, foreign shareholding share. Um, so um, that's, that's one of the, the key reasons why we started. But of course, there are, there are lots of other reasons as well, um, such as customers, um, risk management, um, and employees. And of course, um, we wanted, um, as my board always says, you know, when we, when we look back um, 20, 30 years from now, we want to know that we've done the right thing. So, so it's a it's a kind of a mix of all these reasons. Um, so when we look at sustainability from our bank's perspective, there are really five pillars, um, ranging starting from you know what we can do directly to what we can do with our clients, um, CSR, governance and risk, and um, advocacy work. Um, however, when we're talking about sustainable finance, we are really um, focusing on what we can do with our clients um, and how we can generate profits in a responsible manner. And um, although, so the reason I'm bringing this up is that when, when, when people talk about sustainable finance, um, a lot of the conversation is about, um, you know, um, market instruments, it's about green bonds, etc. But um, when we look at sustainable finance, we look at both the risk and the opportunity side and we are looking at opportunities um, and risk actually across all our customer segments. So not just the big, um, the, the corporates and the SMEs, but individuals as well. So it, it's really a, a holistic thing that we look at um, when we try to do this. So um, zooming into the, the kind of client pillar or sustainable finance, there are, there are really two perspectives that we look at. Um, one of um, the the things that we started off with, and this is it's arguably harder, um, but really important, is how we understand the risk um, that um, you know environmental and social issues would bring to the bank. Um, 
both in the immediate term as well as the longer term. So, of course, we look at things like credit risk. And so the conversations that we have with our um, bankers are things like, you know, I've been doing banking for the last 30 years and we've never had to ask the customer about, you know, their uh, environmental pollution limits. So, so these are these are very new things that are that um, we're introducing to the business. So, looking at things like, for example, if the if the the borrower has any has had any major controversies related to environmental or social issues, um, looking at potential physical and transition risk um, coming um, for the client, and it could even be things like you know, um, what are the the potential disruptions to their supply chain in the next five to 10 years or 20 years when the climate um, uh, change um, gets really bad. Um, so these, and, and typically these are things that even many of our clients are not thinking about. So these conversations tend to be tough. Um, of course, we've got things like collateral and legal risks. So if, if um, land, for example, is contaminated, then we, get, we might get settled with a cleanup cost. And of course, reputational risk. So now this is something that I guess the conversations are um, quite can be quite um, heated, I guess, with, with some of the NGOs who come and bang on our doors and say, you know, um, wh what are you doing about financing of you know, coal and palm oil? And those are the difficult conversations that we need to have. Um, at the same time, um, we as a bank and in in the countries that we're operating in, we are trying to move as fast as we can. Um, but in a situation where you're the only bank moving and you're the only bank putting down um, some of these um, requirements, then you lose all leverage with your clients. If 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 clients then see you as the bank not to go to, you would just lose all your clients and any leverage that you could have had just disappears. So, so it's a, it's a fine balance between, you know, moving quickly, but also not moving too quickly so that um, it, you become irrelevant. Um, then on the right hand side, we've got positive impact. Um, and we do that, as I said, um, at all levels. So with all types of customers and, um, it's not just um, so if you look at our tool at the bottom it's called the positive impact products and services framework so it's not just looking at the services uh, the products but also the services so so questions like you know how is someone who is visually impaired going to use our atms so we don't have answers for these but these are all questions that that we're we're um um actively looking at so um, this is my last slide. So I just wanted to talk about some of the challenges in operation, operationalizing sustainability um, from, a, from a bank's perspective. And um, keeping in mind, we started 18 months ago. Um, so the, the entire industry is still really nascent, although um, since the central bank has joined um, NGFS, um, the, it, it's uh, starting, to, starting to accelerate. However, we're in the very, very, very early stages. Um, the entire landscape is, you know, um, still struggling to understand, um, you know, the basics. So I came from a, a non-sustainability background um, and I started looking at sustainability in mid, I guess, um, early to mid 2018. And it took me about six months, six hard months, just to understand what this, alphabet soup was, um, you know, just all these um, different, different associations, different standards, different regulations, different, um, you know, so th there were so many things and they're all not comparable. Um, so they're not, um, so one is an index and one's a, a risk ma rating methodology, one is a reporting methodology. So it, for, for a newcomer, this it could be really, really daunting. And this, I'm afraid, is where many of the ASEAN countries are still at or, or um, trying to come out of. So um, finding the right balance um, has been 
um, really, I think, quite a quite a challenge. And you know, so um, we we recently hosted a session um, with CDP at um, at our at our premises uh, before the lockdown. And um, you know, we one of the leading banks put up their hands and says, "But if we do this, then we're going to make less money, and what we're going to tell our shareholders." So so it's still a very very kind of um, uh, big decision for them as to should we just tick the boxes or do we really want to do this? Um, in the, so in the clients as well, so um, most clients, so if you think about ASEAN as, as, a, as, a, as a region minus Singapore, um, a, a lot of people um, have just recently come out of poverty. So if you're looking at you know industries like palm oil, like rubber, um, many many people and many of the, the the people employed in these industries are really still in the survival mode. So given this, you know, talking then about oh the longer term and you know what they shouldn't be doing. Um, often doesn't go down that well, and there is a lot of discussion about, you know, um, environmental and um, social justice. You know, the fact that the Western countries have exploited us for so long, and now they tell us we can't do anything with our own land. So, so there's there's all this stuff that comes out all the time. Um, disclosure and transparency also um, needs quite a lot of improvement and. Also, the regular the regulatory push is really not there, um, and um, we we a lot of our industry then just says you know we're just going to wait until the government tells us that we need to do it um, because there is um, mostly all all we we are sure of is that there's going to be cost to this and potential business loss, but nobody can really guarantee the upside. So a lot of them are just playing wait and see. Um, there is limited incentives um, to do this at the moment, um, sustainable finance at the moment. Um, and of course, um, I think um, there is a, a lack of common definitions um, of what is sustainable, what is green or not green, et cetera. So um, yeah, that's it from me. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Luann, for sharing with us this uh, difficult role of a bank having to kind of manage a balancing act between um, sustainability and business priorities. Um, so to kick off the Q&A session, I would just like to ask uh, a question to that, that can go to all three of you. Um, in Asia, do you feel that there's, there's still kind of a hesitant, uh, hesitation around ESG? sustainable finance thinking that it's still greenwashing or or people are are already past this as they are in Europe for example maybe when you can answer first <laughs> can I answer honestly yes. um, <laughs> so I guess you would find some companies that are really trying to you know um, really, really um, take on sustainability and really look at their entire operation, etc. But if you ask me, most companies and, and Kish, please, so Kish would have a, a lot of experience um, for the uh, on this, but a lot of companies are still at the greenwashing stage. Um, basically, what can I do to appease enough people and get them off my backs? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Kish, go ahead. No, I think I think it's it's I think what's uh, we've not reached a stage where the boards or the CEOs are provoking deeper thinking on capitalism and its future. So it's always about balancing act, and when it's about balancing act, it's not fair for organizations to prioritize and deprioritize some aspects of sustainability and 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 ignore some other aspects. So I think it's all about at the moment laying the foundation for good governance on ESG issues in businesses. At the end, I think that's where businesses are are putting most of their resources, uh, putting the right foundation for good governance. Uh, if you look at statistics, I think about fifty-seven 
a little over 50% of the banks are having senior management oversight on ESG issues. Otherwise, they're left to uh, CSR departments or, or communication, corporate communication departments, which are basically driving this to basically look good and, and tick box uh, on some of the expectations of either investors or uh, regulators, some basic uh, listing, listed company requirements. Uh, yeah, so, so effective management of material ESG risks, uh, I think that requires creation of robust policy frameworks and also integrating of science-based standards. I think that's where the biggest difference between US, UK and Asian markets is. So where in US and UK, you would already, you would already see businesses looking at science-based approaches, targets, and they have a bit of uh, scenario planning and all of that. But in Asia, we are still looking at the fundamentals, which is one, what is my motivation to embark on this? How will my business benefit? And what would be the right kind of governance uh, that I need to put in place? So that's, that's the big difference in my view. Great. Um, Yuki, did you have an answer? Um, yeah, as I, as I shared some case studies, you will see that um, depending on which part of Asia you are, the story is very different and what motivates uh, banks is going to be really different. I think if we talk about ASEAN, which is uh, higher middle income developing countries in most cases, the motivation is probably the weakest because you don't have a strong policy or regulation like China. You are not dependent or you don't qualify anymore for any international, um, international public finance. And you are still too small in the capital markets. So the international investors like the US um, or the Europeans aren't looking at ASEAN markets so much. So you know, it's not like, yeah, you're kind of in, in between those, those countries. And then if you, but the thing is, I think the really biggest thing that, that ASEAN should be looking at is the physical change in the climate and, and biodiversity. Because if you do do the forward-looking scenario analysis, you will quickly find that ASEAN is so vulnerable mm. that really, you know, Right now, everyone is looking backwards, but what ASEAN really needs is for looking scientific scenario analysis. And I think that is what will probably, if anything, will start to change the man's mindset as people understand how dire the situation will be if you keep on you know, business as usual in many of the sectors. I think that that could be the breakthrough that isn't yet, but could be promising. And, and I think that, and also the Asian companies are where a lot of the tech solutions are going to be born on climate change. And so you do have a lot of promising companies that are going to be the solution providers. And so there is also good news as well. Thank you for that hopeful um, answer. Um, so I'm going to start fielding questions from the Slido. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. So how do you get major companies on board with ESG and what unforeseen benefits are they enjoying that they didn't expect initially? Yuki? <laughs> um, I think this is best answered by Luan because <laughs> I can say a lot of things, but it, it, it would be, yeah, I, I think really someone who is actually experiencing that. CIMB has made a lot of good, um, I mean, it. I think CIMB being, you know, the, the leader in sustainable finance in Malaysia, being the only leader at the moment is a very lonely place, but it, I'm, I'm sure that it also gets a lot of good credit as well, you know, a lot of publicity and, uh, and first position, you know, being a first mover is also has its advantages and disadvantages. So I guess that that is, um, yeah, I think maybe Luan or Kish should, should be answering this question. Yeah, Luan, go first. Yeah. Okay, so um, 
so we 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 do a lot of capability building um, with our clients, um, you know, uh, and a lot of a lot of people wonder, you know, wh why are we doing this? we you know, but, um, but when our clients understand the situation and our motivation and what it's going to be if things get really bad, I mean, that, that's the, the theory, then they will kind of realize why we're asking them these questions, why we're, we're asking for certain things, and um, then come on board. So we, we do a lot of capability building um, with our clients, but also um, we, we offer them um, incentives. And so we've, we've launched um, our sustainability linked loans and that's kind of opened a, a lot of doors and there's a lot of interest. And um, we actually, so working on those is, is really, satisfying because you know you, you have kind of money on the line and you do have your customers who are kind of committed to do a certain uh, number of things over the next um, four or five years um, so so that that's some of the stuff that we do um, we also for example for newly listed companies kind of handhold and kind of teach them what to do etc so um, yeah, it's a it's a combination of things. We we also pull in people like Yuki, like WWF, like Kish to come and speak to the boards and top management because those are the those are really the guys you need to convince. There's no point convincing you know the sustainability guy, the finance guy who takes a loan. It's really the CEO and the board, and that's where we we need to get them. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think. Uh... Companies like CNB are very rare where you have believers like Blue End who can champion this agenda with the board and CEO. But largely, I think uh, it's very difficult to move businesses away from their focus on single bottom line or the short term focus on quarterly targets. Uh, they rarely have that, that far sight uh, ahead uh, to adequately anticipate uh, environmental and social risks, which are only increasing by the day. Uh, and what is lacking at the moment to clearly position the benefits of embarking sustainability or sustainable finances, the availability of data, the true cost of operating businesses in an environment which has mounting environmental and social risks and pressures. I think that true cost, the data is not available enough. It's not, uh, it's not simulated within Asian environment where a lot of businesses are still developing uh, and a lot of industry constitute of small and medium enterprises uh, where they have other constraints as well. There's also cultural issues, cultural differences, the way businesses are operated. I think all this uh, pose a, a very uh, a big challenge in articulating the business case itself. So if you ask, there's no clear answer on what are the benefits which could be meaningful to Asian businesses if they were to meaningfully embrace and, and embark on a sustainability journey, really. Great, thank you. Um, I have a last question for everybody. Um, do you already know of ideas or even plans on what we need to do so that the coronavirus measures will support the <laughs> Of course, there's always going to be that question. <laughs> Did everybody understand? Can you repeat that? Yes. Um, do you already know of ideas or even plans on what we need to do so that the coronavirus measures will support the sustainable development goals? Mm. That um, OK, if I can, uh, I, I see clearly two or three areas. I mean, uh, globally, if you see the phenomena, I think there's a lot of countries, governments are expecting uh, sharing of uh, healthcare infrastructure, information, intelligence. Uh, that's where partnerships, SDG 17, comes into play, uh, dealing with various economic fallouts. A lot of businesses are going uh, are shutting down uh, because of inactivity, uh, not product. Certain sectors are hit really badly. 
uh, daily wage earners. If you look at India, there are thousands and millions of migrant workers who have gone without wages and, and they don't have sufficient access to health care. So that's another area where, where, where people are currently looking at how do we improve that and that would be your SDG health and well-being uh, and also uh, reducing inequalities uh, and also the trade barriers which, which are increasingly uh, growing more evident uh, uh, with a with lot of businesses have already started even in developing countries they've started to realize how codependent or how dependent they are on the various complex supply chains globally uh, and and these kind of extraordinary scenarios were never taken into consideration when looking at the business continuity measures or, or, or principles so i think there are clearly a few areas where i think uh, businesses and also governments can clearly contribute to putting some some uh, solutions in place so they're able to clearly contribute to the sdgs uh, I would say, if you ask me the number of SDGs, I think it would be definitely SDG number three, which is good health and well-being, uh, reducing inequalities in terms of uh, access to healthcare infrastructure and facilities, and also helping the disadvantaged uh, uh, laborers, workforce, and all of that, and also 17, which is partnership for the goals, and also 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. I think uh, that's an area where governments are constantly, I think the post COVID world will be a lot different. Uh, I think it's kind of a big call for everyone, including small and large businesses, irrespective of whether it's developing or developed countries. Yeah. Um, from my side, um, so the UN Secretary General made a lot of plea for the developing countries to to support the the uh, developed countries to support the developing countries on this crisis but as you can see you know all the countries uh both poor and rich are affected very hard economically by this as well as um uh the the, the medical system and the whole economy is in crisis at the moment globally so what's going to happen is that the rich countries aren't going to be able to help the, the poor, poorer countries on sdgs and it really means that the that each country really has to mobilize its own domestic resources um, to to pass through the crisis and develop um you know redevelop their economies and one of the things that the un or unfi specifically want to help is supporting the, the domestic financial institutions to work with their own governments for green growth that that we really do need um, the government to work with the private sector in rebuilding the, the, the economy and we want to make sure that it's not going to be business as usual that that they take this opportunity to really look at what is the um, value added that can be obtained, you know, what are the green innovations that can be put in place now um, and that uh, to kickstart the economy. So that's something that we are starting to think about and discussing internally on how, how the UN can help. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we are going to wrap up now um, since our next session will start soon. Um, I'd like to really thank all of our speakers for being part of this conference and for our, all of our participants for being with us. Um, don't forget to stay for the next, uh, for the rest of the series today. We've got a great program ahead of us. Um, the next session will be on society, race, and the environment. And I'll let Stephen give us more details. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much, Yuki, Kish, and Luann. I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your night to come and present here on this, um, the Harvard community, everybody on Twitter, and everybody here online. Thank you so much for participating in this. Um, we'll give each everybody just a few minutes um, to get some water, take a bio break, and we will be back at the top of the hour. Thank you very much again, guys. Take care, have a good day. <laughs>